welcome uh, to the Philosopher King, uh, Queens. I almost said Kings, that's terrible. Queens, because perhaps um, it doesn't, there hasn't been that many Philosopher Queens before, and, and you, 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 um, you women are the first, perhaps, Philosopher Queens ever, is that, is that correct? I'm not sure we're coming, you know, in, in the lineage of Camille Paglia. I don't know if she would call herself the queen, but she's certainly the philosopher androgen. So um, I think we definitely have a lineage to, um, you know, bow our heads to. So not the only ones, but quite rare, quite rare. Quite rare, right. Uh, there, there's been philosophers you know, who are women in history, but they are quite rare, aren't they? Um, so you tell me a little bit, you know, before I introduce you, introduce you tell me about that lineage, because that might be a good place to start. I'm going to get my fan. Okay. Okay, here we go. Yeah, Rachel, do you want to talk about um, your lineage? Yeah, there's, there's been a lineage for a while. Um, when we think about, like, Joan of Arc, we think about classical opera, we think about the Amazon tribe. There is a lot of philosopher queen energy when we think about Cleopatra, when we think about mythology in general, and um, everyone from Medusa to Aphrodite. We have different philosopher queens. What Camille Pellia did was formalize it in her magnum opus, Sexual Persona, which inspired a bit of a cult following um, among, I guess, dissident academic types, cultural theologians, creative people who didn't see gender as a binary construct, but that were also not, you know, social justice, you know, or even trans necessarily, but like this, this lineage, this philosopher queen type. And um, from Would there, it be correct to say that it's, yeah. it's, it's somewhat of a hidden lineage, like it pops up sometimes, but, but it's more of a hidden lineage than, say, let's, the more explicit philosopher king lineage, if we could talk about that. Yeah, I, I think it would be hidden because the, well, I mean, you, you've got Plato's Republic, you know, Socrates, it's, it's always like symposiums, men. Um, and there, there aren't very many female philosophers in general. Um, like the most recent one I can think of, um, well, you know, the ones that we hosted at the Philosopher Queen panel, you know, um, like Nada Power and uh, Alyssa Parisi. Um, but I can think of Donna Haraway before that, who wrote the Cyborg Manifesto. Um, but who, who did we really have before that? Like maybe Hannah Ardent? I hope I pronounced Hannah, that Hannah Arendt, yeah. Hannah, Hannah Arendt, yeah, she, yeah. She, was, she was around early too, yeah. Yeah, there's a French philosopher I live in France called Simone Veil. Uh, I not was the, just about to not the most her. very famous. She's wonderful. She's one, oh, an amazing incredible. philosopher. And incredible. And uh, she's not as she's not uh, well enough known, I, I don't think. And um, yeah, that's one that made made me think. I never really would have thought of Medusa as being a, a philosopher, but 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 uh, but well, maybe it's she more, does. Maybe it's she more does. The lineage, you know, the lineage, it's more yeah, like the imagery, the, 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 the archetype, the ar yeah. archetypes that, that accompany, um, you know, what you guys are about. Um, okay, well, why don't why don't I just uh, give a short introduction and then I'll I'll give you the floor. Okay, how how does that sound? Okay. Beautiful. So um, so we have uh, Rachel Haywire. You've written the um, the manifesto of the philosopher queens, um, and uh, and you and Raven. Um, do a lot of, you know, conferences and discussions at, at the STOA and other places. And, and um, you've worked with, um, you know, at, at the Alexa, you've created something called the Alexa Salon. Um, Rachel, you're an entrepreneur and you're into, into virtual reality and art and fashion and philosophy. And you wrote a book called The New Art Right. And I want to, I want to, question you a little bit about that very provocative um, uh, title. 
And then Raven, it says that you're a socialite. Uh, I thought that was a, that was a hilarious um, bio that you wrote, um, uh, a socialite. Uh, uh, in a mosaic of independent intellectual milieus ranging from Justin Murphy's Indie Thinkers to Peter Lindbergh's The Stoa, she hosts interview guests at The Stoa and is currently developing a philosophy of the ovum, secrecy oh, and marriage, okay? So, so all, all of that is, is very interesting and, and wonderful. And um, I'll just give you the floor and say, welcome uh, to Parallax. We're, we're new, this is our sixth Parallax lecture. Uh, we've had several, several lectures. We've had, we have some good ones coming up and we've had uh, a few with Hansi and, and uh, Raul Eshelman and, um, and uh, Alexander Bard and, so anyway, welcome to, to our, our new sort of parallax movement and please have the floor and uh, for let's say 45 minutes and then we'll come back with, uh, uh, I'll ask you a few questions and I'll, then I'll open up the floor for everybody else if that sounds good for you guys. Yeah, that sounds so. great. That sounds good. The Philosopher Thank Queens. You. The Philosopher Queens, yes. Um, so we're gonna begin by uh, having Rachel kind of explain like where the manifesto came from. And then we're gonna go through and kind of have a bit of a dialogue about where that ended up going and what the future may hold for kind of building a movement of women mm -hmm. who are armed with uh, reason and logic and also this like kind of libidinal drive, right? Like to, to try and charge ourselves to go forth into the world and create a philosophical movement of philosopher queens. So Rachel. Tell us, what's the origin of the um, Queen Manifesto? So I wrote the Philosopher Queen Manifesto to carve out a niche that I felt had always existed but had been kind of obscured and that women like us needed to get together because I had seen two polar extremes. I had seen the ultra traditionalist conservative women on one end, and I had seen the social activist, extremist feminists on the other end. And I started to think, well, what about the femme fatales? What about the women who occupy that space in between? What about the women that transcend these labels of traditionalist or social activist? What about women like Camille Paglia who wrote about this pathway? Uh, about this aesthetic exploration, uh, about this creative invocation of the tonic, the hidden, the mysterious, the forbidden, the shadow, if you will. And the manifesto, I, I can read some of it here. We are the rising of the divine feminine in its tonic form. We are philosopher queens. We blast open the doors of perception and explore the deepest areas of our minds and spirits. We revive the power of chaos and her original essence as our new order begins to take shape. We are philosopher queens. We are the origin of every story. And the origin was a big part for me about the origin of these works of art, uh, about these works of literature, uh, about these empires, uh, about these civilizations. Well, where did they originate from? The Divine Mother. And how did the mother come into be? Through struggle. And that struggle led to birth and that birth led to entirely new worlds, entirely new species. And that's why I talk about the origin because I think that people often forget about the origin. They sometimes think about feminism as a, a hashtag self-care, hashtag boss girl movement. Um, some people just think about feminism now as the same thing as Black Lives Matter and trans and it's all intersectionality. You know, um, they, they all they just mush it all together. 
And uh, a lot of the work of these great philosophers and artists and musicians has been obscured by this modern polarization. So when writing the manifesto, I meant to speak to these things, to, to, to speak to the, these women who maybe were feeling disenfranchised, who didn't have a place that they really felt that they could be comfortable on being expressive as the, the women that they, they are. You know, they, they maybe felt that they needed to hide the more expressive parts of themselves. They needed to tone themselves down to make themselves more traditional, or they needed to become activists and, you know, social justice types to, to get in with that other end or, you know, boss girl, you know, hashtag like posting selfies on Instagram of their, you know, bathtub with the flower on it or whatever the chakra of the healing types do. Um, <laughs> so, so, right. So, yeah, it's, it's reactionary, but we, we all know who I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, well, what about the rest of us, right? Who are we? Who are we? Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I thought we're philosopher queens because we question everything. And we're not in it for the, the fame or the money. We're in it for the knowledge. And that's what all of us have in common. We are seekers of knowledge. We are seekers of new realms, new possibilities. And like Camille Kalia, we understand the cycle, that it isn't all one or the other, that sometimes there's Apollo, that sometimes there's Dionysus, that sometimes it's a chaotic stream of inspiration and beauty. And sometimes it's a very ordered hierarchical building, you know, of structure. Sometimes it's both. And sometimes these cycles revolve, you know, just like Spangler was talking about with civilizations. That's how gender is too. Um, throughout the ages, there are many women who would have defined as one thing who have defined as something else just because the era is different. One era's Amazon is another era's liberal activist and one era's Cleopatra is a, another activist burlesque dancer. As the times change, the people change. And as the people change, the society changes, the culture changes, new archetypes develop and new archetypes transform. Absolutely. Now, Raven has been very encouraging about the Philosopher Queen manifesto. I mean, she was so encouraging about it. She's like, we should turn it into a panel at the STOA. And I felt like I had to say yes, because I'd been going to panels at the STOA. I'd been, I, I did my own panel at the STOA about aesthetics and building an aesthetic movement. Um, and I'd gone to a lot of Raven's panels where she was hosting just re really interesting guests and really amazing topics. So I'm like, sure, I'd love to do this panel. And then it kind of took on a life of its own. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like there's something else as well. I mean, Rachel, like I was following Rachel, the great Rachel Haywire, um, before when I was just listening to podcasts um, about a year ago. And we met in New York City. And there was just like explosions of like synergy and synchronicity. And we've been working on projects ever since. And I think that that was kind of like the first, you know, there's this individual right? We are individuals. We are kind of separated from one another as, as, as women, as philosopher queens. Um, and, you know, finding Rachel was this moment of like the beginning of building a tribe, right? This like moment of a dyad forming uh, where we could begin to explore ideas together and also appear in, in public, which I think is also part of what's interwoven into the manifesto. I think this is something that Rachel brings that's really unique is this drive to expose, to expose ideas, um, which I think is inherently connected to the willingness to take risks, the willingness to stand for what you believe in, and to go out there and piss people off, which is, of course, another aspect of going against uh, the grain of conformity, of mimesis, which is another aspect of the manifesto, is pointing out the mimetic aspects to the groups that have been emerging around women's rights or women's interests, um, the kind of matriarchies that are forming 
are kind of gathering around certain polarities in terms of these, these like, as you, as you described, like hashtags, right? So we have like this kind of trad wife thing. Uh, we also have this like social justice thing. Most groups have conservative elements, right? Where there's this kind of reactionary, like, we don't want to stare at the phallus. We don't want to face the disgusting aspects of not only ourselves, but also what it is to face the world today, what it is to face um, genuine, real issues of misogyny and sexism, but also to accept what men have done for the world. I mean, I think that this is one of the things that uh, really drew me to Camille Polio, which she like opens her book and she's like, you know, if civilization had been left to women, we'd all be living in grass huts. And I think that starting there <laughs> is like this brilliant confrontation of the differences between men and women. And the fact that there is this dynamic between these, these, these forms, these two different forms that are distinct and have different polarities that they embody, which is also why even speaking about the feminine or speaking about the masculine has legitimacy. Um, where that, that dimorphism is actually embodying principles that exist, not only merely within biology, but, you know, the ideas of, like, chaos versus order. Um, but I think the other thing is not to be reactionary against the concept of the androgen, just because there are people in the social justice world who are kind of emphasizing trans issues over the issues of these, these two polarities, right? So we have to also speak about the androgen and the different aspects of what it is to be androgynous. Um, the androgynous aspect that is about becoming adult, becoming a synthesis, um, and the androgynous aspect that is a regression or an infantilization, um, which Camille Paglia really lays out uh, very well in her book, Sexual Personae, in terms of what a decadent androgen um, emerges as. So all of these things are, have been kind of mulling around between Rachel and I over the over almost a year that we've known each other. And I think, you know, her bringing forth this manifesto kind of just like pierced into the, the discourse or the currents um, in order to get both of us to just begin to work together, um, begin to kind of form a, a dyad and try and basically through example, attract other women to what we're doing. Um, rather than kind of having this, you know, um, drive to like, you know, like get people to join us through some sort of ad campaign. It's like, no, if you, if we're going to lead by example, we're going to, we're going to talk about these things openly and without fear. And if you want to join us, you're welcome. Um, but we're not going to chase after you, you know, it's, this is, this is what we're doing. Um, yeah, I don't know, Rachel, if you want to respond to any of that. Well, I mean, chasing after somebody it's always the wrong idea if you notice but none of these recruitment groups are effective on none of these campaigns to get people to vote for a certain thing are being very well received now during the election you can see everybody angrily tweeting about how they're sick of getting calls about who to vote for um it's because we don't like things that are trying too hard um and i say in the manifesto i'm going to quote another part that which we do not reveal becomes that which the world desires. So it's the, the hidden element, what we keep to ourselves, that becomes the object of fixation from the society, from, from the other, that which we don't reveal, what people come to us for, what people are interested in, what is intriguing to them, not what we have right in front of them. Because what often happens when you put something in front of people is that they get into a linguistic tit for tat, their mind immediately goes to preconceived biases that they have, and they're already fixated on defining something based on their own models of reality without really looking into other possibilities. So by creating an element of mystery and keeping it sacred more people are drawn to the mystique that has been repressed um 
and not, not just repressed, um, but relegated to the shadow realm because women aren't really supposed to be into certain things. Um, and this is where the philosopher queen part comes into. There are certain philosophies that women aren't supposed to be into. When was the last time you heard about a, a woman to Heidegger? When, when I met Raven, one of the things that impressed me about her was that she was a woman who was studying Heidegger because I don't <laughs> meet very many women who are even willing to like acknowledge Heidegger, <laughs> you know? Um, so, you know, um, what about the, the women who are into um, somebody like Nick Land, you know? Um, there was the CCRU, there were the Xenofeminists, um, there was Sadie Plant, right? Um, Amy Ireland, but th these are obscure names. These are their small names among our circle. There weren't very many women who were interested in looking at these, these darker philosophical explorations. You, you don't need very many women who are into Nietzsche. You, you certainly don't meet very many women who are into a lot of political things, um, you know, like you have the, the conservative moms, right? Um, and then you, you have the liberal activists. Um, but well, what about other realms of politics? There, there just aren't very many women who are participating in these things. I feel that they can because it's, it's unfeminine. They feel like it's unladylike or that they don't belong in the discourse because that's for the men to discuss. Um, you know, when we think about how men went out and hunted, you know, um, but women have been discoursing since the beginning of time. And people seem to forget that. And I think it's time for us to remember. Sure. I think it's a good question. Um, why aren't there more women? Um, Especially because, you know, what I've observed is that women who are into philosophy also tend to be into intersectionality. So women who are in the humanities, um, they're often into queer theory and they're often going off into, yes, kind of Frankfurt School, kind of, you know, postmodernist, post-structuralist. And there's this intertwining with political activism. Um, and while I think that, you know, there seems to be a lot of momentum in that direction, the fact of it is there are more things to think about than political ideology. Um, and I think particularly as we are confronting the changes of our reality due to technological shifts, um, we, have to, we have to get outside of frameworks that we've inherited, particularly ones that have mass appeal. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about um, you know, exit, like Bard's exodology, um, you know, obviously the concept of exit, um, or what I've been, uh, I've been listening to Hermetics, which is another fantastic podcast hosted by Meta Nomad. Um, and he has been bringing up the concept, the archetype of the anarch, right? So as opposed to anarchist, which is a political ideology, the anarch who stands outside of society and dares to think for himself, and typically himself, really. I mean, I think that there are certain kinds of personality traits that you find clustered more often in men and women. Antisocial behavior is more often a male trait. Um, and I think that you need the capacity to say, I don't care about assimilating into society. I am being antisocial. Um, I'm not falling into what, you know, Ted Kaczynski calls like kind of the leftist over socialization, right? I'm standing outside of that. And I'm defining for myself what I, what I think through observation, through kind of a cold analysis. And I think that's almost necessary in a time where there's so much confusion, there's so much chatter, you know, in our mimetic environments, so much disinformation and manipulation. And if we're going to see clearly, which I think is also part of what Bard is invoking in terms of the seeking of the authentic phallus, how are we going to penetrate and order all of this kind of flat, you know, array of information and ideas that were being kind of awash in this feminine principle of the internet. I mean, it's, it's, it really is like kind of the medium 
of our existence now. And we're kind of uh, confronting this. I've been thinking a lot about the Adam and Eve story, right? Like there's a certain amount, you become conscious, you eat from the fruit and you, be, you realize your nakedness and you hide in shame. I think that that's what we're doing, you know? And I think women in particular, uh, like at least, you know, maybe not in particular in a, in a, you know, in an emphasizing sort of way, but like the issues of women are particularly interesting to me um, because as a woman, you know, I'm also seeking relationships with other women and uh, also seeking to build a matriarchy, which has completely dissolved, um, that is intergenerational, uh, which is like totally unraveled. Uh, we don't have that, you know, lineage of, of cohesion, uh, which is exactly why Rachel, you know, and I are, you know, coming together is so important. But what are we, you know, what are we, what are we doing? Like, what are, how are we facing these issues? How are we thinking about uh, these, these changes in our world and going back to first principles and staring at things with bravery, looking at what has been on earth rather than hiding our nakedness in, 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 in our shame. You know, um, we, we are kind of given this task, I think, to face, you know, what science has unearthed, what psychoanalysis has unearthed, what like the observation of the 20th century and all of its horrors have unearthed, what birth control has done for women, how women coming into the public sphere has changed social and political dynamics, how now we're dealing with mixed like co-ed um, offices and how that kind of creates tension between the sexes. Um, and also just the concept that comes from feminism of a woman being essentially interiorly male with just the form of a man, of a woman with, with breasts and, you know, with the rounded body of a woman and, and, and to operate as if just this kind of Cartesian male subject um, which causes a lot of tension if that's not how you, that's not true. If that's not true and you're operating as if that is true, then a lot of misery will come of that. And I think we're seeing, we're seeing that as well. Um, and then of course, the basic issues of the human condition, you know, envy and bitterness and despair and you know jealousy and all of these kind of emotional aspects of what it is to live in a community and to see the things that other people have and to want them but to not admit that you want them and i think that's also something that's tearing apart communities of women particularly because we we've, we've really and i think feminism has really played a role in this um has pushed aside the role of the mother and has made it something lesser you know, you hear a woman who gets married at maybe 23 or something, and you're, you're like, oh, what a, what a pity. Why would she do that? You know, she has her whole life ahead of her. Why would she get married and have children? And what if women want to do that? <laughs> like, what if they want to get married and have children? Like, how would that rub against them that their society is trying to make them conform to this ideal of being, you know, a, an economic subject? So I think that all of these dynamics are essential for women themselves to be talking about in a very lucid way. Um, and so far, I mean, at least in my experience, the, where I've seen people discussing these things, honestly, is not in communities of women, it's in communities of men. Because men are also in, a, in an impoverishment because women don't know what the hell they're doing. Men also don't know what they're doing. But, you know, they can at least see from the outside that there's something going on with the women that's causing, you know, issues in terms of these, these polarities coming together. Um, the sexes coming together and being able to interact in harmonious and different ways. Different ways. We're struggling with plurality. You know, we, have, we cannot seem to grap, grapple with or accept the idea that difference does not mean better or worse, <laughs> you know? Um, that the feminine principle isn't somehow subordinate or like, you know, bad or evil. Right. You know Different. what I mean? Different <laughs> doesn't mean better or worse. Just because gender is changing doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at gender, that we should 
pretend like gender doesn't exist, that we should ignore gender. No, we should engage with gender. We should explore gender. Um, we should, like Raven was talking about, you know, a lot of women feeling like they have this, this female form, you know, um, but they're not really, you know, women in, inside. Um, well, first of all, what does it mean to be a woman inside? Because the definition of that keeps changing. You know, well, what does it mean to, to be a woman? Does it mean to be a mother? Does it mean to be a CEO? Does it mean to be a mother and a CEO? To be neither? Does it mean to be soft and sensitive? Does it mean to be dark and powerful? Does it mean to be beautiful? Does it mean to be intense? What does it mean to be a woman? Does it mean to be hysterical? Does it mean to be neurotic? Does it mean to be a sex goddess? Does it mean to be anti-sex? What does it mean to be a woman? And people really seem to have a lot of different answers to that question. Um, now, when Riven was talking about a lot of women, they want to get married and have kids. Obviously, that is fine, and nobody should ever say, like, oh, you're not a, a real feminist because you want to get married and have kids. Um, I would take this a little further. I would say that if you want to be married and have kids, that you should be able to be a, a boss girl if you want to. Say you want a thriving career, and you want children. Is that suddenly off limits? Say you want to be married and don't have children, and that you want to be a dancer because you like dancing and you want to participate in a sexual type of expression. What's wrong with that? Say you want to have kids, you want to get married and you want to start a company. Why not, right? Why, why are all these limitations being placed, whether it's the the feminist or the, the trad lives, social justice, boss girl, why are, why are they all so restrictive? And philosopher queens, we are not restrictive. We are open. We seek knowledge. We're philosophers. And if you go back in history, you can hear about all of these other women that have sought knowledge. Um, some of them have been obscured, you're right. Um, but some of them have, have not. Um, Amelia Earhart, you know, what, whatever happened to her? You know, she, she flew that plane and she, she disappeared. Why, why did she disappear? Has anybody really looked into that? You know, um, whatever happened to Cleopatra's children, right? What, what was the next step in Egypt, right? Um, didn't really look into that too much. Um, what about Kali? The goddess of chaos and destruction. How was the mythology for Kali invented? Is this just the, the Kali Yuga? Or is this a, an archetype of this cycle of birth and rebirth, of creation, destruction, creation, destruction? What does it mean to be a woman and why are so many things off of limits? Yeah. I mean, there's even, there's even a question about like whether or not the word woman is even a, a good one, <laughs> you know, or like something worth even, you know, keeping alive. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, I think the question of limitations is, is definitely important. And um, I think that it's very easy especially in an era where we have these like alien thoughts that come, come into our minds um, and we want to conform ourselves to these visions that come from the outside. Um, and I think this is the, this is the power of the, the, the mimesis that comes in from behind and kind of channels your, your energy or your vision. Um, but it is not your own. You are not authoring it. Um, it's coming from the forces of others. And this kind of purging of the voices of these aliens, I think, is like one of these initial steps 
to becoming a free thinker. And of course, that's, I mean, I think why, um, why philosopher queens? Why not just hashtag queen? You know, what is this? Why are we even bringing in philosophy? I mean, I think that um, both Rachel and I are deeply committed to ideas above all else. Um, freedom of thought and thinking aggressively, independently, seeking antagonism, you know, not taking it personally if someone disagrees with you, experiencing like the, um, the, 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 the charge. I mean, I think there's, there's this libidinal aspect to engaging in the world of ideas. Um, and I think women can bring that charge. Um, they can kind of bring the gestalt of their sexuality into the sphere that is um, fiery with the discussion of what it means, you know, not merely to be a woman, what it means, but it means to be human, what it means to interact with technology, um, what is the future? You know, there's this very regressive kind of retro um, movement, I think, that's happening that in, in, a, in a reaction to the confusion um, that the human psyche is kind of going through in response to the chaos of our technological environment. And to stand still, to purge all of this kind of, you know, mimetic desire and to try to chart your own path forward, um, I think is to kind of rise above these like waves um, of chaos and to investigate principally. I mean, I'm, I feel very early. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I'm young and like just beginning to learn about all of these things. And so I think not drawing conclusions too quickly um, is part of what feels important um, and, to be, and to be open, like you're saying, Rachel, and, and to consider ideas and to not recoil from them because they're uncomfortable, um, not to recoil from criticism because it, it makes you feel bad. You know, it's like getting into that zone where you can be brave and you can commit to your own ideas, but you can also face the scrutiny of others. Um, that's, I mean, that's what it is to be on the front lines in terms of intellect, intellectual battling. Um, and men seem to be doing this all the time, uh, at least in these little communities, whether or not it's very good or not, I think is kind of dependent. Um, there is definitely a lot of like circle jerking, I think that happens, um, but there are genuinely um, generative male communities of philosophy. And I think that, you know, once the women find, we'll find those places, we'll, we'll start bringing our own um, thoughts to that world. And um, I don't know what will happen. I mean, like, like we were talking about, this is new. Like women being in this position, um, at least within the kind of history that we, that we are familiar with, is, it's novel. It's novel. And so there's still a lot to investigate and ask questions about. And I want us to open ourselves to those questions and uh, see what we find, you know, principally. Yeah, there, there have been some attempts, you know, um, this is kind of an obscure example. Um, but <laughs> I was an industrial music producer growing up, so kind of like goth electronic music I produced on my laptop and a few synthesizers. And the genre, industrial, which is kind of like an offshoot of goth and punk um, with a little bit of a, a cyberpunk element, um, is very masculine. The music was masculine and the outfits were masculine, like big stompy boots, you know, and like very militant post-apocalyptic gear, you know, um, on the dance floor. And it had a very masculine element. Um, but there were some women in the scene too, and we loved the music all the same. And we started to make our own music. Um, and I, I formed a, a record label for women in the goth industrial scene, w women in the darker subcultures. You know, I formed a, an alliance you know, um, a, a vanguard, if, if you will. Um, and I, th I think that many things like this have occurred in the past, but maybe they, they just don't um, really get uh, recognition. Um, I, I remember like I, I read a book about female futurists, you know, and most people only know male futurists and you know, the, the future is manifesto, it's misogynistic. So, you know, women are dissuaded from like even getting into futurism, like at all. 
like period. Um, yeah, so, so that there's a lot of stuff that women just feel like is forbidden and off the table. And well, I'm like Kim Palia. I don't feel like anything should be forbidden. Like we need to get to the inner core of the spirit of this Dionysus, this occupation of our souls, our bodies, our minds, culture, the universe, life the world, how, how do we interact with the Apollo? What happens when we become the Apollonian? What happens when we become the matriarchs? What happens when society is flipped upside down? When we don't know what gender is anymore? What do we do then? We carry on a torch of philosopher queens. We carry on a torch of self-expression and beauty without limitation. We carry on a torch of the divinity of the self, which is not strictly feminine or strictly masculine. It is perhaps androgynous, like Alexander Barr talks about. He says androgyny is close to shamanism. Perhaps philosopher queens are channeling something shamanistic. We are between worlds, we are bridges between the feminine and the masculine, occupying both realms and exploring each gender, yet defining as female, defining as queens, defining as women who are seeking knowledge. Cool, does that seem like a good place to jump in or? I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was a brilliant conclusion. So Women seeking knowledge. Yeah, I thought that was a brilliant conclusion as well. Um, I'm, I made a few notes here, but I, I'm kind of going to throw away my notes and just say what comes to my mind. Uh, and maybe we can have a short conversation and then I'll open up everything to the, the few people here who are here. Um, I was thinking as you were talking, I was thinking about how limited our, our personas are in, in this culture, how we ha have such cliche versions of everything. Um, and it occurs to me that that's kind of what, what this, this boundaries that you guys are, tr are, are trying to break. Like I was reading Tyson Yakapura's book and he talked about how, his, how in his indigenous village, the women were really tough and they got into street fights and and the men were kind of sensitive and <laughs> very, very, very soft. And, and uh, um, you know, and, and, and it just occurred to me that, that we, we, we're, we're kind of living in a, in a time where we, in this global culture where, where gender has become a prison of, of some kind. Um, and also, I just wanted to, I wanted to say that my own personal experience is that, you know, in my, in my youth, I, I, was, I was a musician, I played in bands and people in bands have long hair and they, they, they kind of adore women. Like we, we worship women on some level in, in our twenties, men, and they even try to dress like them. And, and uh, you know, we, we see that in, in popular culture. And, and, um, and I think later as I, I became older, I started becoming interested in masculinity again. Like I didn't give a shit about, you know, what that was before. Um, so it's interesting. I, I, I feel like the culture has, has just flipped over on its side or something where, where people are now looking for like uh, uh, they've been sort of shattered in every direction and all they have is cliche models of, of what masculine and feminine could be. So they're, they're going back to try to find a, you know, a, a more a deeper archetype. Does that make any sense? Can, can you riff off anything I, I said there? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I mean, it seems like this is a perennial issue, right? Where people seek outward guidance for who they should ought to become, right? I think um, the fracturing of traditional roles and also just the kind of, fra like the, the, the internet itself just being this kind of importation device where you, you are being formed, your cognition and your experience of your thoughts is being trained by this being, this thing that's like maximizing for your attention on screen. Um, and that fracturing as well kind of causes this shattering of the mirror. Um, and then of course people are seeking to conform to those 
communities. And so they find themselves trying to model, um, you know, Instagram influencers, popular hashtags. Um, it's, it's very, I think it's very, I, like, uh, very much a root in celebrity worship, idolatry, um, you know, kind of a scrambling to form identity. And a lot of it is very adolescent in my eyes, um, where it's like, we don't want to become like our parents. There's this like elder kind of phobia, you know, um, and so we, we seek to become like our peers. And this is extending beyond yeah. Yeah. adolescence into people who are like in their 30s and even 40s. Yeah, th that's the lack of transmission, right? Uh, uh, you know, and the lack of a vertical culture where you have, you know, you have elders up here and you have young, young up here and they aspire to move up to, to embody the, the elder. Uh, and it seems like pe young people are just imitating each other. You know, I'm a teacher and I, I notice my students are uh, you know, they don't have, they don't have in models of imitation except for each other. They're just, they're just, it's, it's a kind of narcissistic fog or something. And the mind blowing thing is there are people in their forties and fifties who are trying to mimic 20 year olds. Oh yeah. Wow. I am just blown away by this. It's, it's like crazy. You know, you see, I mean, like these kind of advertising campaigns for different social justice pursuits and I'm seeing like old women you know, getting involved in this stuff. Um, so there's definitely this idea, I think, um, that the children are going to save us. And they have the right ideas. And mm -hmm. we're going to get behind them with our signs. And we're going to let them lead the charge. Yeah, the and, children's crusade. Of, it's like uh, something yes. like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, you know, the children of God will save us. You know, yeah. uh, and it's all, it's all kind of this um, deification of the political you know, yeah. secular yeah. society has just kind of formed itself within the political narrative as being of the utmost importance. And everything else is like to bow down to this um, very matriarchal force of attempting to kind of take care of everyone um, through the state. And yeah. it's, yeah. it's It appears very... on the surface to be very patriarchal, but it is also very matriarchal. You know, it's exactly. Like, exactly. Yeah, you know. it, mm -hmm. There's all these weird paradoxes that you just have to be able to like, First of all, you have to be able to understand paradox, right? Yeah. Which is in and of itself. A that's a big one. That, that's such a big one. You have to understand paradox. You have to understand nuance. You have to understand the ebb and flow of gender or civilization. You have to understand the Hegelian dialect. You can't get stuck in one realm because if you do, then you're not able to see the other side. And if you can't see the other side, then you can't see anything that's around you. You're, you're just stuck in a little tunnel of your little echo chamber. Um, and all of this copying that we see on Instagram um, and the social justice movements um, from the, the boomers to the millennials to, to the Zoomers, um, that this lack of originality, this fear of going outside the grain, you know, um, the fear of, of being shamed, you know, the fear of being kicked out of one's tribe. You know, um, I, I think is a big reason for all this mimesis and jealousy, you know, um, of women copying one another because they just want to fit in and they don't want to be looked at and scrutinized. Um, where Raven and I, we, we love being scrutinized. We love critique. We love argument. Um, that is part of being philosophers. This is part of, of being a philosopher. We don't want to be treated differently because we're women. We don't want to be like coddled and told that we're special just because of our gender we want to be known for our theories and our thoughts and yeah. our creations and um even the, the whole idea of like do we need a, a female philosopher movement i'm even like mixed on that even, even though I, I started the philosopher queen manifesto because we don't want to just be known for being women we want to be known for what we create um and then if you think about it that was actually like one of the original motivations of, of feminism. Um, but, but what is feminism now? Is it burning bras? Is it, you know, um, going to a sex club? Is, is it body positivity? Like, what is, does feminism even mean now? Is, is anti-feminist relevant? Is, is that just the feminism on the same coin, you know, different sides? Like, what, yeah. what is 
even going on here? Well, when you guys were talking at the very beginning, uh, we got attacked by a troll. I don't know if you noticed that. Yeah, I that. saw that. <laughs> that. There was these horrific, you know, um, messages like women should die and really terrible Women stuff are slaves. Going. Really, I, I couldn't women believe it. Women don't deserve rights. And uh, so I apologize to expose you to that. I was trying to get rid of it, but I didn't know, know how, and I finally figured it out. Okay. But, I but, wasn't but, sure if that was, um, like, a troll of mine or it's no, it's nobody who's here so it must be somebody i guess on facebook or i, I don't know how i don't know how that oh okay. yeah maybe but I, I wonder about like being exposed to that kind of thing how that that affects you because you know as a guy it just doesn't does that sort of thing doesn't come my way so so i'm wondering mm -hmm. I'm wondering how you, how you, how you, you know, Camille Paglia had a very heroic attitude towards that. It's just, you know, be strong, right? Be strong women and strong men. And I wonder, you know, how does that, how does that, you know, what do you, what do you do with that? I think I Rachel's probably experienced a lot more of that than I have. So I, I get, I get a lot of it because I'm very, I, I don't, I'm not a social conservative. So I have a lot of men on the right, a lot of conservative men who would just tell me to shut up and have a kid, like per pretty regularly. Um, yeah. This is simply because I interact with conservative ideas on a philosophical level. You know, um, I can be a conservative, you know, philosophically, I can be conservative aesthetically. Um, but if I'm not conservative in my lifestyle because I don't have a kid, who am I to, to talk about certain ideas at all? So I definitely get a a lot of harassment for men um, and, and women and trad wives, They're those types, they, they don't like me very much. Um, and that, that's not even mentioning like the Antifa's and the social justice activists, like I don't even mention them. Um, I just, <laughs> it was in one ear and out the other. It's not uh -huh. relevant to me because it doesn't affect me okay. because I don't take it personally because that's their issue. And that, that's it, it's their issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, not yeah. to say that it isn't a burden, you know, not to say that it isn't energetically expensive to deal with that yeah. kind of attention, but I think that this is not something that is merely an issue for women. It seems like women may get more kind of attention from multiple mm -hmm. directions. I think that Rachel is pointing out something really important that not only will men come after go, but women will come after you too. So it's, it's definitely difficult to, to stand against the crowd. Um, and that, but that's, you know, that's, if you have something to say, I mean, it's, it's, this is once again, perennial, like the mob, right? Goes after yep. those who stand for the future. I mean, the prophet, right? We think of, you know, if you think about Christ, right? Like the mob, is what like forces, you know, the government to put him on the cross. You know, it's the mob that yeah. destroys the future. And it's in that destruction of, yeah. of the prophet that the future actually comes to be. Um, and that thing around with those archetypes and understanding that to speak the truth is not some sort of lackadaisical, like, you know, kind of fun thing that you do on the weekends. This is like <laughs> sacrifice. This is something that you do because you care about it and you yeah. put yourself on the line. You have skin in the game, you know, yeah. like Rachel has skin in the game for what she says. I'm beginning to get out there, you know, and say the things um, and starting to, you know, kind of see that black will come my way in order to do that. But I think, I think that's part of why like an alliance is also super powerful um, that having, yeah, having you need Rachel, community, don't you? You need, you yeah. need a strong community to support you if you're going to, you know, say something that will, if you're, uh, that, you know, that will, that will o offend uh, the, the super collective ego or whatever of, of the society. Mm. I, I'd like to say something like very contrarian now about our own community. Okay. I feel like even in our own community, like there aren't very many women who have that fiery element. Like I am a fiery woman and you know, Raven is, is fiery and yeah, like, got a lot of fiery friends, um, but it seems like the majority of women in this community are, are very earthy. There's nothing wrong with earth, nothing wrong with earth at all. Um, <laughs> but it, it seems to be like the exclusive element in the, the sphere that we're in for, for women, besides 
me and Raven and the women that we've been brought into this community. You mean the hippie kind of earth goddess kind of archetype seems to be, uh, you know, in ascendance at the moment again or something like that, right? Whereas yeah. the fiery yeah. radical urban type is, is, is um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's there, not there's, quite it, but. It's about like radical or urban, but expressive and vitalistic mm -hmm. intense vitalistic. and metaphysical occult and not yeah, so you guys celebrate the the dark the, i mean Ra rachel especially you celebrate the the dark in the dark ar archetypes and, and perhaps these archetypes we've talked about this in our last conversation um are lacking in in in, in, a, in a protestant society and in, in anglo society especially there's it's more present here in france i think in the Catholic tradition, but even then, there's this sort of uh, there's the, the the Mother Mary images are very are very um, benevolent and divine and and be you know beautiful. Or, whereas whereas this there's this fierce other feminine archetype which you find in India and in most places of the world, which seems to be quite repressed in in the in the in the, um, in the contemporary culture. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. I think so. I mean, I think that this gets into issues of how Christianity has dealt with the issue of sex, you know, mm -hmm. um, and the fact that instead of creating some sort of uh, tradition or, I mean, you have Tantra, right, in other cultures, right, there are these other kind of dimensions of how sex has been explored and organized in order to yeah. reduce the mimetic uh, c contagion effects which can cause this ricocheting of jealousy and envy and and violence in the community that can come that can come from like being interested in in uh the same woman or the same kind of sexual prospects um dangerous certainly uh christianity i think has just moved to suppress um and it has an infantilizing aspect to it i think mm -hmm. in as well where we all become children we all get kind of pushed into the androgynous state of, of being a child you know, the virginal mother um, and the, the virgin of Jesus Christ. And somehow that's supposed, we, we can maybe conflate that with a kind of mimetic goal, like we ought to be that way. When in fact, like the libidinal energy, the drive that comes from sexual expression is what moves us. You know, it's what gets us to, to suppress our neuroticism. I mean, that is huge yeah. to suppress your neuroticism and to take a risk you know, and to maybe lose and to deal with failure. You know, the other thing about it is like, can you confront the fact that if you risk yourself, you put yourself on the line that you may fail and that you have to stand to be judged by others for your failure and you have to get up again and try, you know, like that type of behavior activity. Um, I think when you have low neuroticism and more antisocial personality traits, it's much easier to just do that. And of course that yeah. clusters yeah. men over women. Um, and then there's the few women uh, that have to happen to have these personality traits. Uh, and I think that that's maybe what Rachel is speaking to archetypally in terms of fieriness, yeah. right? Yeah. Just being like throwing caution to the wind and going out and doing things. I mean, Simone Bay is like yeah. a crazy example of a woman who was just like- yeah, She would go and work in factories and things like that, you know? Crazy. and. And, uh, she went to the front lines. This frail, anorexic woman yeah. went to the front lines of war and yeah. tried to fight. You know, like this woman was so. They wouldn't let her fight in the end, yeah. right? So she died alone in, in a hospital in England because they wouldn't let her go out. And, and she just, she was, a, she had an incredible, almost Joan of Arc type of oh, absolutely. Uh, spirit, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The, fighting, the fighting spirit in women. What, what has happened to that? Um, well, I, I think of a, a lot of bands like the Plasmatics punk band, lead singer, came on stage with a giant mohawk on a tank and just started going off. You know, Sparks came out on stage with giant machinery. Wendy O. Williams, 70s punk band. They were pretty much the first punk rock band to really have a, a female fronted vocalist. Um, I, mean, I love them. Um, think about like Kathy Acker. She was a post-structuralist writer. Um, she's a feminist, but she wasn't like a, a second wave burn your raw feminist. She wasn't like a third wave, 
like sex worker, transgenders, feminism, feminist. She was just really into sex and really into self-expression and really into breaking down conceptions of gender. Um, and she did it her own way. It wasn't about being a part of a group or a collective. It wasn't about some, some populist herd. It was uh, about the exploration of the self, right? Um, Donna Haraway, who wrote the Cyborg Manifesto. She wrote about how identity was something that could be played with, about how aligning with people just because of their gender or their race or their class wasn't enough to really unify people. What needed to happen was people that had similar ideas needed to unify based on common interests and based on common knowledge, you know? Um, it's not about like, we're all this same thing. It's about how we all have this idea, you know, we're philosopher queens, we have an idea, um, you know, and of course, Donna Haraway took a lot of crap. She got put on trial, you know? Um, Wendy O. Williams got put on Things like there's a lot at stake, right? Like, for a fiery yeah. type of woman, right? Um, there's a lot of, st a lot of, st you know, whereas um, I, I know that you, um, I, Raven mentioned the tantric tradition and I, I know that in, you know, in India and in, in, in Tibet, there's certain very powerful women who are teachers who are, you know, revered, right? They're, 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 but, but they're not usually in, uh, they're not, they're not, they don't have, they're usually hidden. They're, they're, they're called the hidden lineage. They're very, the, the, you have to you have to um you have to find them they're not uh, you know whereas you know i guess it's just ma male people tend to be um tend to be out there in the front uh you know with their uh with their voice whereas the, it's more rare for mm -hmm. a woman to to come, be, have this fiery kind of passion and come out into the into the marketplace and to have something to say mm -hmm. yeah big big time i mean i we need more of that yeah I, I do you think know, a lot of the 80s, the, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, we need more of it, but I wouldn't expect there to be a lot of it. I mean, mm. like, to, also to expect women to be that which they are not, I think is also yeah. part of the issue with what's going on today, not only with just like feminism and the pressure on little girls to save the world, you know, to like take on the mantle of, of like empowering women and taking down the patriarchy, it's like, not every woman is motivated to do that. And if she thinks that she's, there's this gap between being this like powerful figure who takes on the world and who you are as just a, a normal little person in the world who's like wants to take care of your, of your community, of your family, like none of, all of those things, I mean, generally has been diminished, like care for the core, for the hearth, the world around you has mm -hmm. become secondary to celebrity status to appearing yeah. Yeah. like cool and aloof and uh you know to be working for the greatest good but like are you like really you know you're like tweeting like what are you doing for your community <laughs> like fuck nothing and i think i think part of it is too like i think women are busy I think that's also why we don't see them in some of these communities. Women are busy. They're yeah. doing shit. And so they don't have time to fuck around and talk well, about it. Especially if they have a career time. and children, you know. <laughs> children? Yeah. You yeah. have to be a superwoman to be yeah. managing and taking care of the home and giving attention to your children. The attention of the mother, particularly in those first kind of five years of life, is so powerful for the child. Yeah. It directs the child to see what is valuable and important. Yeah. You have to prioritize that if you're yeah, a mother. I think so too. Yeah. I mean, I I might I have a one year old right now, and my wife's oh. been at home with the one year old for a, for a year, right? And yeah. uh, because she's had had the chance to take time off work, um, I think it would be terrible. I mean, that's how most people live, right? They just it's careerism, right? They go, you know, and they drop the kid off at the daycare and. So uh, in that sense, I feel like I, 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 I feel some sympathy for traditional conservative people who are saying, you know, um, you know, take your kid, you know, you know, that, that, that parenting is like, um, especially for mothers, just as, that, that intimacy with the child is so essential. You know? Yeah, it's essential for their development. It's also excruciatingly painful 
to become uh, what is the the abject, you know, to mm -hmm. to be the thing that the child has to reject, to become the thing that is that you are like as the child repulsed by, which is the which is the sacrifice of the mother. The mother mm -hmm. has to become that which the child revives, re re like reviles, and in order for the child to either eroticize or become you know the phallus, right? So mm -hmm. the, the, this behavior of conflict you know between these three principles you have the father the mother and the infant like there's tension as much as there is symbiosis between all of those different aspects of the family and the mother plays this very critical role in the beginning of life and she has to accept that she will become the evil one you know she will become the devouring mother to the child because the child mm -hmm. must leave her and that transition is painful and in fact, we're actually aided by our evolutionary history in being given repulsion. The child is given repulsion by their body to get them away from the mother, to take the risk to leap into the world and leave her behind, even though that is painful. You, you kind of delay experiencing the pain of that because the repulsion moves you to get away from her. Yeah. And you have to endure that as a mother. Like, yeah. and, and I think a lot of mothers especially of uh, this previous kind of generation, the generation that raised me, for example, did not let this happen. They wanted to be their children's friends and they wouldn't, they were not satisfied with the idea that they would become evil to their children. And so they attempted to smother them. And yeah. That is also part of what we're dealing with, which is like yeah. children who didn't go That's through That's the devouring, this, like, devouring mother uh, exactly. Ar archetype, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Sure. So to become fully conscious of all this stuff, I think really is difficult, really difficult to face, especially if you are in a time where, you know, you believe in this kind of like, you know, everybody gets along and, you know, this is perfect socialist utopia that we can construct using the government and through technology and no one will ever have conflict with one another. It's like, no, literally at this like, kind of this fundamental dot, like triad of, of the family, we have both synergy but also tension and that is I think a principle a principle of reality that we cannot escape from and to be conscious of this um, as a developmental factor and to put yourself into it as a woman to say look not only am I going to sacrifice my you know the, the opportunity cost of having a child um, in terms of career or in terms of like seeking opportunity elsewhere I'm going to go through nine months of pregnancy, which will irre irrevocably change my body. And then I'm going to sacrifice my time to raise a child. And then that child inevitably is going to turn away from me mm -hmm. and may actually vilify me. And that yeah. this will go on for potentially over a decade. Yeah. <laughs> That might lead to hysteria. I mean, I don't want to say that it's a cliche, right? Just to talk about feminine hysteria, but but in a way you can see where where, where it could it could come from. I have a, a different take on feminine hysteria, actually. Please, go ahead. So I think that feminine hysteria oh, Can I just stop you for just a sec? I, I was thinking there's a, there's a few people left here. I don't know how many people are, are, are on Facebook and it's um and, and I've been meaning like in the past ten minutes to maybe open up the the conversation uh, so other people can join in. So um, since there's there's three people still here, a few people left and there's three people still here, maybe we could have just an open conversation and I could ask the other people to turn on their co uh, cameras and, and unmute themselves and, and join in. Um, or if, if you feel uncomfortable about, you know, doing that, you can always uh, put, your, put some questions uh, in, in the chat box. Hi, Tom. Well, we have Joe and, and Joseph here. Um, um, so I, so I, I apologize. I interrupted you, Rachel. Do you, do you want to, we were talking about feminine hysteria and you, you, you were talking about your take on that. Yeah, well, I think um, what was considered like hysteria then is um, like kind of like people call every woman borderline now, like people called every woman hysteria, hysterical then. Um, and it's just like women who are going forward in a way that isn't considered to be like proper, you know, um, not to say that hysteria and borderline don't exist. 
um, but they're often like blanket terms. Can I qualify that a little? Because I don't want to sound, you know, uh, I think, you know, the Freudian idea is what well, hysteria is the emotional, uh, you know, um, craziness and, and neuroticism right. is, is mental craziness, right? You know, and, <laughs> and, and men, I probably tend, tend to more ideation craziness and, and women tend towards, you know, the more physical, you know, for obvious reason, craziness. I just mean, it, I, I don't mean that all women are like that. I mean, that's a tendency uh, probably, oh, which we okay. can observe, right? And, no, I, 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 but on the other hand, I, I want to also say that I think that there's, there's a positive kind of hysteria, this kind of fiery energy like that, you know, Paglia seems almost like a hysteria when she talks, right? She's, she's like uh, almost possessed by something and that, that could be a uh, shaman. Right, right. And it's important for us to distinguish between these two types of hysteria. We have um, the, you know, shamanistic, expressive hysteria. I don't think that should be called hysteria. We, we should regulate hysteria to what, what you're talking about, the unhinged and the forgotten, the gone, you know, um, emotions take charge and there, there's no longer like any rationality at all. Like that is hysteria. I'm not creativity, you know, not just going wild and letting oneself go. Um, but I don't think that should, should be called hysteria, but a lot of people- Yeah, and, and Freud, when he talked about hysteria, he was talking about the Victorian age when sexuality yeah. was, was very much repressed. So, so that was part of it as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it, conservatives are too quick to label women as hysterical just because they like say something that doesn't seem feminine enough. You no, know, I, I would never do such a thing. <laughs> yeah, no, not you, not you. Many, many, <laughs> many not not all conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I'm a conservative. I don't, I don't know, know if you would call you one either. But. Well, it's interesting. Like, like Rachel's book is called the, the, the new alt right. And you've, you've <laughs> identified with the right in some way. And you seem to be sort of like a radical artist, like some of the people I, I, I knew in the nineties who were always, always on the left and the left used to be all about free expression and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, live and let live. And, and, Whereas, whereas today it seems to be almost the opposite. It's like yeah. we talked about that also, this inversion. I, I just want to be clear. My book is okay. the new art, the new art right. Not, yeah. there's no alt in it. Yeah, art right. I, I, I thought I said art right, but. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's the new art right. And it's about art being lifted out of the norms of political correctness. It's about having a vitalist movement of the spirit it's about using the ideas of hierarchy and tradition in an occult sense, in a metaphysical realm, creating an aesthetic right, an art right, a creative vitalist right. And that's what my book is about. It is definitely um, not traditionally right-wing. Um, and you would think people would get it, you know, because they have the word art before the word right, but some people think it's like some traditional right wing book and then they read it and they're like, no, that's, that's not it. Um, so, so yeah, um, and the reason that the left has lost that creative vitalism that you speak of, that was very prominent in, you know, left wing 90s art movements. Um, well, I mean, the, what can we blame it on? Like neoliberalism, like social justice corporatism, or is it just the, the times they are changing? Um, I don't know, but I, I think that it's time for us to explore a more vitalistic and aristocratic type of art that isn't regulated to activism and political correctness. Cool. Does anybody, uh, any of you guys want to jump in with some questions for the Philosopher Queens? We won't devour you, I promise. Tom, you must have a question for us. Of course. I have oh, a, Joseph uh, seems to be unmuting himself. Joseph! Do you have a uh, question, Joseph? Tom has something to say. I can wait. I, yeah. Oh, well, I always have a lot of questions. So, so, Raven, so just like, how do you jive with those Portlandians, you know, social justice or as feminists? I don't jive with them. I stay away from them. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, why would I, I mean, I've mostly found myself in communities of men. I really haven't had that many female friends in my life. Um, and the few female friends that I have made and maintained are also very intellectual, very curious um, women who aren't, uh, are kind of outcasts in a way. 
they're also kind of outcast in some some manner. So, but right. that's like very very small group. Um, like I could count on my fingers, like one hand, like how many female relationships I've had that have really stood this test of time, and have also stood my questioning of like the, the milieu that we were kind of immersed in. Um, I went to the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, oh. like really radical left. Like is that that world. famous one, the Brett Weinstein one? Is that that, that yeah, one? Yeah, that's the one. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Brett and Heather were my professors for oh, years. Right. Um, and I studied evolutionary biology under them. So, like, I was always kind of in this weird, uh, like, antithetical milieu at that school. But there was all this, you know, there's all this tension. And, of course, I wanted to assimilate, but also was, like, learning these other things that went against the kind of social positive narrative. Um, and, I've, yeah, I've ha I have one really good friend who's seen me through all of that. Um, and she has, you know, she's much more left than I am, but uh, she's been able to deal with the disagreements and differences between the two of us. That's like one. <laughs> so, right. Okay. Okay. You know. Yeah, because I was wondering, and I'm, I'm not sure if I can, you know, formulate that thought properly uh, without, you know, because, you know, in recent times I'm thinking like all these things they have like a quasi religious quality you know it's like yeah. um, and so and so it's, it's you, you can observe it not only in, uh, in the social justice movement but also like say in spiritual things you know where you see that because and i hope i don't phrase that wrong because women have this freedom today they are way more say uninhibited to you know, fall into this kind of religious stage where they inhabit a completely new worldview, say in spirituality or in, in politics, without being uh, rational enough to, you know, to know, how do I say this? You know, the, the relativity of it, say. And I, I don't mean it in a bad way because I think it's a, it's a result of, of that, historically speaking, new phase we're into, where men, uh, you know, can't or shouldn't impose their worldview on women anymore. But at the same time, it seems to me, a, 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 a subgroup of those women run amok with their worldview in a kind of way without questioning that. Do you know what, where, where, where I'm coming from? And so how, how do you deal with that? What's, what's your take on that? I mean, honestly, because, uh, because, I, have to, because yeah. I have to add one thing, because the problem okay. is that you can't really talk uh, with and to these women without submitting to their worldview. And that makes a rational discourse like kind of complicated. Yeah, and they usually well, have men hanging talk, around, too, that are kind of like that. sorry to interrupt. I, I, I don't talk to women like that. Like, I, I don't I know. act with social just as activists, I don't need to worry about, like, sometimes they, they mob me and, like, they dox me, but, like, they're, they're not in my circle. Like, the, the issues I have with women now are the ultra traditionalist ones who make fun of me for being neurotic and not having children. Right. Like, social justice activists, they're, they're not even in my sphere. Right. So I'm yeah. dealing with the, the other end of it. I'm dealing with women who, who are looking down at me because I have tattoos. I like, I'm sorry that you have to deal with social justice activists, but like, I don't even think about them. No, not, not necessarily social justice activists, but it's yeah, like, you know what I mean? like for me, it's if there are social justice activists or some spiritual people who have like a worldview of angels and you know, this is Reiki and oh, it's completely oh, right, all right. encompassing. <laughs> it's like, it's <laughs> like the same thing with a different, with a different yeah, paint yeah. on it, you know, it's like yeah. that. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, you're, yeah the, the new age spiritual. Right. I, I mean, I call them the chakra click. You know, they're the chakra click. They're the the healing goddesses. The hashtag gratitude. Right. They're, right. they're a mob. <laughs> they're a they're a mob. They they have their self care smoothies and their their healing crystals. And I don't think that you should interact with them. Now, if, if they're coming at you, if, because if they're really coming, they're very angry deep down. No, I don't. I don't, I don't so mean it like that. Just don't touch them. No, I don't. Okay, I don't. I, I don't mean it in that way that uh, I or we we shouldn't interact with them. The, the question would I'm be like how how you know what would be the proper 
step or you know, or say culturally speaking like for them you know to have a perspective on their worldview and being instead of being inhabited by the worldview right because i think that's the part of a philosopher to say well there are worldviews and i can can have a critical distance to it and i can if you're a good philosopher you can even have like a critical distance and you should to your own worldview and that then then it gets interesting but if you talk to social justice warriors or new age people and i think with men it's it's the same but it's like if if you're inhabited by it and you can't have a critical distance then like a discourse is really problem problematic right <laughs> So what, yeah. so what do you do from, from, from... I think that's really problematic what you said, Tom. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. But I, I just think that it's best to freedom of association. Like, don't go to events that they're at. Like, don't talk to them. Maybe that, that right. sounds dismissive. I'm, I'm not trying to be dismissive here. It's just, you know, you, you've got like 10 women you can talk to, you know, and, and two of them are interesting, logical, rational, and you've you got eight of them talking about like the helium goddess of the moon and like the vaginal painting of the whatever, like would talk to the two. Like, I don't I'm still, I'm still not, I don't mean that personally, you know, I, 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 you, you just mean like, like, what can they do? No, it's like, like as, as a cultural, more... as a cultural yeah. development. So women have sure. this, this freedom now to choose their worldview. And, but you know, it's like in, in, in human histories of time, it's like a really short period when they can do that like yeah. 50 years and so mm -hmm. it's like okay we had like say 40,000 years of male dominated worldviews or whatever and so and so suddenly females are able to to do that but it seems to me at one point that they're not have developed culturally you know a, a form of critical and I don't mean that in that way men majority of men can't do that either so don't get me wrong but the point is like culturally speaking so what you know, how, what would you propose? What would be, you know, the next step? You know, I know how I deal with those women. You know, it's not, that's not Okay, the so, so you mean for the women? I, I don't think we should, for the, for the women? Yeah. I don't think we should force change upon them. We should let them do what they want. Right. Like, I don't think that it's our job to tell them how to behave. I just think that's why I say it's better to avoid that. Not, like, as a dismissive answer, but because it's not our duty to make them more like us. We, that that's inauthentic. Right. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, and I mean, and I, oh, I, think that, I think that also like, women have had their worldviews in the past. It's just that it was, was not in the public sphere. Right. And then also <laughs> I think that, um, you know, so their way of influencing was happening within the home. They would, you know, influence their husbands or their sons or their fathers to kind of enact their own political interests or social interests. Uh, women had this kind of soft power. And I see that now operating, but it's also engaged in the public sphere. So right. there's also an issue of men themselves turning themselves away from women and keeping to their own ideas and not letting the soft power of women influence their thinking because that's kind of where I see another issue is that if women are then exerting this like power of, of their kind of sub radically subjective experience of their ideas. So having no kind of internal distance um, in, in, in their interior between their kind of I and the worldview that they are kind of playing around with or, or exploring, the fact that there's no gap there and that they're radically, their eye and the worldview are a singularity in right. terms of their internal experience. Right. Not having that gap, um, you know, and then because of the sexual dynamics between men and women and because it's the, the availability of women in terms of long-term partnership is so scarce, you know, and that kind of uh, power dimension between men and women and the fact that lots of men just like get in line to conform to what the women want right. in order to to get attention from women because of course people want attention from women but, right. like that's right. just the thing like people want attention from young beautiful women and so if those young beautiful women have certain kinds of worldviews uh, they'll just fall in line at least on a preference falsification level in order to get you know get the view get that eye you know get that experience get that attention for validation um so 
both things in terms of like men standing on their own, not falling into the gaze, not kind of getting caught up in the limerence um, and conforming themselves to what uh, women want. And then women themselves, I think that this is part of why like, you know, the philosopher queen manifesto is not written as a, as like a kind of evangelical, like here, we're going to convert all these women, but it's like, we are just standing out here and we're going to start modeling this. And if you want to join us, join right. us, right. you know, yeah. through mimesis, like you can, you can come and join us, but like, I'm not going to go out with my Bible and like thump it to try and convince other women. That's just a waste of my time, honestly. Like, I think, you know, both Rachel and I have identified this and I think it's part of why I've been attracted to accelerationism and um, Bard's exodology. Like exit, okay? Like voice is like totally, it's been so just like the like debased. You know, the idea of voice is just like completely flat. Everybody gets the same platform online. Everyone has the same value in terms of their voice. And it's like, why, why, why participate in that when you could exit and engage in these back channels? And then I, I think that's also something that's interesting. That's a hard thing is the hidden aspect yeah. of, of like these communities online that are going underground right. to have right. real discussions, right. to really dig into controversial ideas. Like that's where you want to go. Right. Like I was yeah. thinking about men and modernism and I was thinking about something that Hansi said um, I think it was on the Jim Rutt podcast about how we need an anti-populist politics and that we need to be here. It is political metamodernism is the opposite of populism. So we, what we don't need is the, the voice. We need the exit, like Graven says. We need original founders getting together and forming new societies. We don't need power brokers appealing to populist sentiments to win old societies. That society is, is old. Um, we're not going to conform to it. We, we want to create a new society that's going to conform to us. We're pioneers. We're visionaries. We're leading a new way. Right. I mean, in Germany, you would get canceled for that. That's for sure. <laughs> you get canceled, yeah. I, I don't know. Like, I, I've, I've been canceled quite, quite a bit. I'm still standing. Still, you, you don't exist unless you've been canceled. You have to be canceled, don't you? I mean, in order to be somebody, really. I mean, <laughs> I think anyway. I mean, God, uh, like, who wants to be? Who wants to live up to whatever expectation uh, that is? Um, well, it's like I, it occurs to me that I, I, I just had a thought in all this. If you don't mind me jumping in again, but. It occurs to me that um, for a movement to, 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 to be integrated, there's always, uh, there's, always, there's always this powerful attraction of, of, of women, right? Young women, as you were saying, there's always. And, uh, and I think a lot, I've been doing men's work. I think the building of male, male character uh, seems to be very, very, very important here because it's so easy to become um, seduced to be, to be a sort of, uh, you know, a, a slave to that. Uh, in a sense. They call it a simp? A simp, right. A right. Simp. <laughs> so it is a simp. Oh, yeah. it's a, you become a slave to that and... and, and I don't I get mean, that. What's a simp? Yeah, what's a simp? Yeah. Oh, God. A, a simp <laughs> term for like a man who basically like, you know, worships a sort of internet goddess figure. Worships internet goddess figures. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a slave. It's a... But, I, I th at the same time, I want to say we, we need these women at the, uh, with these, these powerful magnetic women to, to create this, uh, let's say, um, artistic movement in, in the whole thing so it doesn't remain male and intellectual. Like uh, it usually remains, if it's just a bunch of men, it, it, online especially, it becomes extremely autistic, it seems to me, uh, on some level, right? Um, me and no, Joe, right. Joe's down below, we have this thing called the Forest Philosophers in, in Avon, France, and and, uh, and and we don't we're not online at all. We just we're 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 a, we're a salon. Like we just started, and and we're just offline, right? Because I think the online world is, especially the male world, is so, um, yeah, so so male and autistic. Whereas the the real movements I remember in the '90s, there was always this kind of you know night polarization dynamic and creativity between men and women, which. I feel lacking and is one of the reasons why I, I kind of like, I get excited by hearing you guys talk because there seems to be like this fresh breath of fresh air. In Thank you. <laughs> I, I no, we can't hear you. 
Me? I can't hear you, Joe. Joe. No, Joe is Joe is talking. You can't hear you, Joe. Yeah. Oh no. Okay. Well, you can try and figure it out. And uh, here we Joe, go. Joe, you're unmuted. I can ask you to unmute. Uh, in the left hand corner. Yeah, there you go. Okay, man, unmuted. Ah, beautiful. We got okay. you. Great. You know, just to follow up on that, um, you know, breaking down on the categories of uh, philosopher, and I, I'm coming from the art world, and Rachel, what you were saying about, you know, the poets and Kathy Acker, and, you know, and I'm just thinking about the um, inutility of having these categor categorical um, distinctions that aren't necessarily necessary at all. You know, you know, so you t if you take somebody like, like Kathy and going back to somebody like Gertrude Stein, um, Juna Barnes, you know, the, where women were really uh, not only creating the movements, but were at the forefront and, and, and breaking the categories and not getting into any um, hierarchical uh, linguistic uh, distinctions. You know, so like when, when I think of like Queen, right? Like philosopher Queen, I mean, isn't that linguistically putting you into a hierarchy of some sort of thinking that, you know, at, at the beginning of this, I, I think Raven, you said, um, you know, what would happen if women were in the huts? What, what sort of language would we have emerging from that? You know, mm -hmm. so these are sort of the, I, I, I think we have too many false distinctions and I, th I think we get too um, too concerned with um, going into uh, you know camps of of of, of uh, you know I, I, this is where language breaks down and and so like where does art and philosophy intersect is like a, you know a, a, a concern that I have um, you know so where 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 are you, what are you guys thinking about that. Well, I think that it's okay to use the term philosopher queen because it's not about putting people into a box. It's about putting people in a place where they feel free to express themselves. Free thought has always been my top priority and I believe that it's Raven's top priority or one of her top priorities too. It's, it's about freedom of thought. Um, and so that's why we've created philosopher queens for freedom of thought, um, freedom of expression, freedom of, of gender, you know, free, freedom. Um, it's a really important thing to the arts, the philosophy, the culture. Um, so, you know, terminology, though, you're right, it does have a tendency to get bogged down and, you know, once you define something, you know, um, good, good luck keeping it what it is. I'm sure that in like 10 years from now, we'll have philosopher queens where people have like defiled their original message and like we've been kicked out and we're like no longer philosopher queens and we hate what it's become. Um, but that's like every group, that's like every subculture, that's every movement, that's every political party, um, that things change, things evolve, things take on new forms. And, you know, if philosopher queen becomes something that we're against, um, we can either like fight for the term or, you know, forge forward with a new term. And I don't know, it depends on the, the instance. So I, I really, I do appreciate what you're saying. Um, and it, it doesn't make a lot of sense why you would have these concerns and I have these concerns also. I think that um, I don't think we're necessarily anti hierarchy either. Um, I, I think that there's definitely an elitist streak in both Rachel and my philosophy. And the queen also invokes the matriarch, um, the, the most powerful woman of the community. And I think that there's almost a hyperstitional quality to the invocation of the philosopher queen. I wouldn't consider myself at this time a queen. Um, I would consider myself working towards becoming the matriarch. And there is a commitment to the process of generating what, what is the wisdom of the woman, right? Um, and how that derives and arises out of the body of the woman and what she is kind of tasked with throughout her life. And I think for me, the attraction to the concept of queen um, is of that matriarchal figure, of like the grandmother, you know, of like the woman who has children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren who 
guides the other women throughout all of these different developmental processes in their lives and also you know gives guidance to the patriarchs uh, when they need their their you know, the wisdom of the women to guide them and so i think that that invocation is an invitation for women to consider themselves as more than princesses you know uh as as more than just like wanting to have people lay at their feet wanting to be given gifts wanted to be kind of treated with this um, kind of goddess-like worshiping. The queen is not someone to be merely worshiped, but she wields the power of the sovereign. She wields the power of the sovereign. And that is a grave responsibility, but you have to prepare yourself for taking on that responsibility. And it's not something that you, you know, give to yourself. It's like something that is given to you. You know, I, I was surprised, like, when people began to you know, because the Phosphor Queen Manifesto was something you can consider a call, Ra you know, Rachel and I, Philosopher Queens, is like to be given that title and to be recognized for that title. And, you know, to give it to oneself, I think, is a completely different um, dynamic. But to invoke it in a hyperstitional manner and then to be seen in that manner means that we're rising. You know, we're rising to take on the responsibility of the matriarchy. Um, and that's not something that is equal to being a princess. You know, that's something that is a, a, on par with, with the men holding their kind of patriarchal order as well. Right. It's definitely not an anti-hierarchy manifesto. I mean, I talk about how we're a new order that's beginning to take shape. I talk about how we're a new current. A new current. Um, like I say... You know, this is not neoliberal feminism. This is American life. This is a return to the energy that has been repressed for so long. You know, like we are and have always been the invisible cabaret. Throughout centuries, we have been worshipped, demonized, obsessed over, and badly ignored. Yet it is time for a new rising. It is time for a new archetype. It's an invocation. It's an invocation of the philosopher queen archetype. I end it with, we are philosopher queens and we deliver this legend. It's creating a mythology for women to express themselves in this new realm. And it definitely isn't about them creating a equality or something like that. How much is that embedded anyhow in, in, in your work? Like hermeticism, hermeneutics, archetypes, mysticism, like, um, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Which one of us? Whoever. Either one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to I talk about the occult, Rachel? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, talk to the, yeah, yeah, the occult, yes, please. Yeah. I just, <laughs> I hear, I hear like a little buzz, I hear a little buzzing. Oh, wait, it's gone now. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so the the occult is the, the hidden, the tonic, the often forbidden, that which is not on the surface, the mysterious. Um, so how do people express the occult through art, through literature, through music, through dance, through theater? Those hidden elements become expressions of the human core. Um, whether somebody is using a metaphor to describe an occult experience, whether somebody is writing esoterically to describe a metaphysical phenomena that they do not want to write about literally. These are phenomena that are being through our sacred esoteric usages of metaphors and symbols and dance movements and even like musical Good kind yes. of like uh, yeah. Buried near near Andrew's Andrew's place because you mentioned dance dance movements. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's it's Good the, the, yeah. the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. hidden the hidden element. It's the the internal the the, the the internal. You know, not not the exposed, not the external. That that which is hidden. And what we do, um, like as artists, is find a way to express the hidden in a way that still maintains its mystery and mystique without giving it all away, 
yet still being able to bring it to the table. Would yeah. you say, Ra Rachel, you're like more of a poet and Raven's more of a philosopher? Because I, I get this, the feeling when you're speaking that you're, you're kind of almost, um, uh, you're speaking in, 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 a, in a kind of language, a, a language of a manifesto, a language like a, a channeled language or something. And then, and then it's, it's kind of a nice balance and Ra Raven sp uh, speaks, she has this sort of clarity and, and, um, and mm. uh, it's very, I find that very interesting, the, the, you know, I, the dynamic I, between you two guys. Well, would you say that Nietzsche was a philosopher or a poet? Because he spoke like that all the time. Well, yeah, okay, like, maybe that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a false uh, di dichotomy. Or, or even um, somebody like... Um, well, but Nietzsche but was the high watermark on, uh, of German literature, so that's kind of complicated with Nietzsche. If you well, go well, with, I, if you go with, there, with there Hegel, <laughs> that's, that's, that's yeah, kind of... Oh, whoa, hold, hold on. Oh. Hold, hold, hold on. Okay. <laughs> there are a lot of philosophers that wrote with a vitalistic impulse. It wasn't just, just Nietzsche. He wasn't the only one that did it. Um, Rene no, and I mean like this way it, of like Ginger writing his, his, his They wrote po poetically. There was a, a pre, there was a cursor, a precursor to Nietzsche. It was called Novalis. Um, what, what about um, even the um, M Mishima? When he wrote Confessions of a Mask, it was poetic. Does, does that mean he, he's not a, well, he a philosopher? A I would, he's a more of a poet right. than a philosopher, I would right. say. But, but what I'm saying is that oh. there's like a lot of you can you can be a poetic philosopher. Of course. Um, everything sure. doesn't need to be academic and dry, you yeah. know. Um, Anne Raven, she's you know more like on the logical end of things, but she also speaks poetically. She also uses creative language. She, she's not, you know, like stiff and and dull. Um, and then I think that the Thanks, stiffness <laughs> oh, and, no. the, and the dullness, well. the, the dullness and the stiffness is, is like I, I I don't like that. Camille Paglia writes. Like the poet. very poetic, yeah. Have, have you read Camille Paulus? She, she doesn't write like a stiff, you know. This is philosophy has room to be poetic. Philosophy should be poetic. Oh, okay. no, I, I didn't Absolutely mean to say what I, what I meant to say was that from, from the viewpoint of the mastery of the German language, there was nobody better who could do that than Nietzsche, basically. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like nobody will ever be better than him at poetry. No, no, no. Like you can discuss the, you can discuss the, the yeah. philosophy, of course, but you know this mastery yeah. of of the language. Mm. It's like that's so beautiful, that's so masterful. It's like there's nobody else, and that's just what it, what I wanted to point out. <clears throat> um, yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Fully, fully, fully agreed. Like, I, didn't, I didn't mean to put you yeah. into like strict categories of types or anything like that, uh, you know, because because we don't know each other that well. But I, I come I, on, Andrew. I'm just That's observing, a, I'm just observing a kind of a kind of like uh, like uh, type of uh, type of, of of way that that you, that you speak, Rachel, and and the way that, that that Raven speaks, and I'm observing a kind of symbiosis and and uh -huh. interesting, yeah, and, uh, you know, yeah. That's Dynamic, yeah, de de definitely. Like she, she keeps me like in check. Raven reigns me in um, because I, I yeah, it's like, like chaos and order or something. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can, I can get quite poetic and perhaps a, a little hysterical in the positive sense of the word. Um, and you know, Raven is is very good at grounding, you know, and she she's very good at getting to the root, um, which is one of the reasons that I love having Raven in my life because. We have so many similar ideas and interests, yet we approach it from different angles where she definitely is more grounding and I am definitely more, I guess, um, poetic, like, like you said, um, and we're able to communicate dynamically because of this. And I, I love having this relationship with Raven for yeah, that reason. Yeah. I've noticed a lot of, this. like, what? I noticed, so, sorry uh, to interrupt again. Go ahead. Oh, no. Uh, I've heard a lot of duos uh, recently, like people who oh, yeah. are showing up in two instead of one. Like uh, I've noticed, like like uh, people have forming kind of powerful writing teams, you know, like dyads. Uh, yeah, yeah, the dyad. I think it's a very important like, uh, form. The people are writing like in in twos now instead of ones. That 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 that, that that's not celebrated enough in in our society or. or you know, co people who write books together, like I don't know, Deleuze and, and Guattari, or 
Bart and Sadegist and, and you know John Bravecki and his friend Christoph. They yeah, these those guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we don't want to <laughs> talk too much about Alexander. Okay. No, <laughs> we talk too much about him. Yeah. Well, I, I like him um, like around here. here. Um, his book, you know, like meta metamodernism is amazing. Like I, uh -huh. I think duos, dyads are great because you can have two people with the shared vision with different forms of communication. Yeah. Um, and you know, like even like if you have like two people playing in a band, I remember like the, the Dresden Dolls when they first started, it was Amanda Palmer, just the vocalist. And then um, the other guy, Jason Ludley, I think it was, you know, um, like he did the like harmonica and the clarinet, you know, um, and they both have the same vision for the band, um, but they were communicating differently, one through vocals and one through a bunch of circus instruments, you know, um, so, so diets are, are so crucial, you know, and people that, that share visions, you know, like it is so important to have these, these different mediums, you know, like transmitting these yeah. messages. And I, I think that that's the beauty of the, the dyad, I mean, by extension, the, the triad and yeah. you know, so it's on and so on. As well, yeah. 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 And I wonder if, if, if uh, arts and literature and philosophy will be move more in this collaborative, you know, direction in the future, there'll be more sort of like, I don't know, because of the internet, it somehow has this ability to, to fuse together minds, right? They might do their work outside the internet that, that, that think on, on a similar wavelength. And so people are kind of meeting each other in a, in a, in a new way. Um, it, it could be, that could be a positive thing or also a, a diabolical thing as well. You know, it could be, hmm, if that makes any sense. It does. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like well, it's almost idea. like marriage. This. <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. yeah creative marriages yeah yeah right. i think we're seeking that i mean the stability of the dyad um and the, the recognition of like you know that the the I, I mean i really love this that bard and and it like kind of uses the word individual rather than individual like the individual mm -hmm. is like kind of an emergent property of of the tribe but the tribe is fundamental and we have this perception of ourselves as individual um, and we go through this individuation process, but there's yeah. always this like kind of the ground of which we emerge is the hyper object of the tribe and by extension, the hyper object of humanity itself, which is of course nested within, you know, in is principally nature. So it's, um, it's interesting, I think, how people are seeking stable forms in a time where there's all of this kind of uh, chaotic instability happening within hierarchies. That is the emergence of these very simple kind of um, almost molecular bonds, right? You you have this dyad that's very po powerful, strong. You can create relationships that are built on high levels of trust, where through this commitment you can speak truth. You can speak truth. You, know, you can expose yourself in the secret world, which kind of goes back into the occultism for me, which is like. Um, the internet kind of privileges this notion of status that is associated with celebrity. It's about the exposure of oneself. Mm -hmm. And it has completely um, cannibalized the private realm. You know, you can go online and watch the total exposure of the family. Like people who literally like live stream all of their family dynamics. You know, that realm, which is the most private, has become the, you know, kind of voyeuristic pleasure of people viewing from far away, the most interior kind of private realms of, of human behavior and existence. And that's just one particular example. There's this like drive to expose, uh, which I think has a hypernormal kind of quality to it because that would have typically been that which was hidden. And so as, as humans, we're kind of seeking, you know, ooh, the hidden thing is revealing itself. Now I must watch. You know, now I must look. It's very interesting as this connects to the beginning of digital libido, which is the discussion of the breast, right? The exposed breast. You know, historically, it's like in, in most cultures that like we would be familiar with, uh, maybe not France, I, I actually don't know, maybe a little bit more liberal there, but you know, the exposure of the breast was like, whoa, <laughs> what is that, right? Holy shit, we're seeing this thing that's very anomalous. Like, it's like watching a fight or something. You like, you stop and you're alert and your like kind of animal nature jump comes in and you just want to watch it. You can't help yourself. Because what's <laughs> hidden, what's hidden is, is the most powerful thing. I mean, it could be a, a breast or it could be something else, right? Yeah, that revelation 
is this moment where all of the eyes freeze. Their attention is enraptured by this revelation. But we've kind of reached a saturation point in terms of the, the exposure of things. Mm. And I think for many communities who are interested in being continuously on the edge, they're actually cloaking themselves once again. They're creating a kind of uh, Bard Absolute, I would say, in terms mm. of penetrating into their communities. Like you can't get into the Discord server or you can't get into the email like threads. You can't get in unless you know someone or unless you've proven yourself in some way. Like, that's a kind of cloaking of that which has been maximally exposed on, you know, public forums such as Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, um, where it's like principally about that maximum exposure and the maximum appeal. Um, and so I think that's where this, you know, interest in the occult seems to also have this parallel principle mm, of learning right. how to read that which is secret, learning how to create secrets for oneself learning how to create relationships where you can build a secret world and interrogate and antagonize within this membrane in order to build something really fucking strong before yeah. the revelation, before yeah. that exposure of that, of that thing, um, which is a skill set. You know, it's a skill set. It, it requires maturity. And that's exactly what the growth process is. It's to engage in these like yeah. marriages yeah. where there's this, you know, antagonism. Well, in a marriage, you, you also create a secret language, don't you? And and that yeah. secret language has an occult quality. And, and, Absolutely. And that Absolutely. that's that that's what that that can't be um, expressed to anyone else. It lives in a private realm, right? And yep. I guess I guess what exactly that's exactly true. What you're saying that that this this extreme exposure of of, of every taboo, right? At least visually, is is like it's like okay, now we have to bring back taboo or something. We have to bring back. Uh, you know, we have to bring back the hidden, the secret, the the uh, the occult. The, yeah, makes yeah. total sense to me uh, what you're saying. I, and also, what's coming up too is like, you know, I think we kind of all gather around the, you know, the sons of these massive philosophical kings like Hegel or Nietzsche, you know, and we're just like, praise be, but. These are not only these. These are not the only people out there. Like, there's a lot of people mm. cast in their shadow, and I think that's also mm. the occult path, which is to go in and look for the people who haven't been placed on this like level of celebrity um, yeah. that towers above all else. And I think that's where most of the women philosophers exist. I feel they just, like that. Yeah. In my, in my experience, yeah. the deepest people are, 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 are would never expose themselves to public scrutiny in any way. Like the, the deepest people I've met, right? Uh huh. Like uh, are hidden. The deepest people are usually hidden, and there's a very good reason for that. It's yeah. because if the deepest people were to go to match on the service, they would sacrifice who they were to appeal to people who didn't understand them. They would be putting pearls before swine. It's better for them. For, for us to be in small groups communicating among people that we connect with, not watering down or dumbing down our message for the public. I would much rather have a small group of philosophers that I can communicate with on a very personal realm than be in front of a huge crowd of people who I need to develop some, you know, fake message for in order to like appease their sensibilities. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of that. I think back to like the, the anarch, you know, the self-sovereign individual and um, how important it is to meet other people that are self-sovereign, you know, and for us to, to not go out into the public and, and join the spectacle, but for us to have deep, intimate gatherings with one another. Yeah. yeah. Guys, I hesitate to, to bring this to an end because I think that it could go, we could go on for for a long time. I think it's been a wonderful conversation. Um, we have about five minutes left. So, so I was wondering if, if, if you want to leave uh, our listeners I, uh, with something. I mean, this will be uh, uploaded to YouTube, of course, and, and it's being streamed on Facebook. And so God knows who's watching it there. <laughs> and uh, that one nothing, comment sorry, guys, I, nothing personal, but we were attacked by a troll <laughs> earlier. Um, uh, in any case, uh, uh, um, uh, is, is there anything like, uh, you want to final, final thoughts, final, 
um, you know, something you, you want, you would like to, sh to share with people? I don't know. Hmm. 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 Well, you know, I think um, if, if anyone out there is feeling provoked, called, I mean, even a negative reaction is a, is a reaction and tease it out, you know, like figure it out for yourself. See if that's something that someone else put inside of you, you know, a thought or a reaction that doesn't belong to you. Like, I think that taking on the responsibility for your own thinking and not blaming society for giving you bad ideas. Like ultimately you are responsible for your thoughts. Ultimately you can craft the virtual world that you inhabit in t inside of your mind. And there are so many people that want to have these discussions. Like I found myself being co completely embraced by the communities that I have engaged with. And it's, it's really amazing to have this warm welcome, um, to, to be invited to this, you know, to, I, you know, both Rachel and I were on techno social, you know, we're talking about these things. People want to listen and, uh, we want to engage more, particularly women, but also men in conversation. I, men are genuinely curious about women. Um, I don't think that all men are misogynists or something like that. Like, I think there's a genuine curiosity about what women are experiencing and what we're up to. And by having these very mature, lucid conversations and digging into some of the most kind of ugh, difficult things to confront, because it's not like this stuff is easy. I mean, there's some really dark shit that we not only have to just like kind of uncover, but we actually have to talk about, you know, and we have to move forward um, because we have to adapt. Like ad adaptation is of, of its significance right now. Um, we're living in a time where we're reacting to shifts that are way outside of anybody's control. Um, and that's, I mean, that's the task. That's the gift. I mean, we, we have the gift of living in this time um, and to not be open to seeing it, I think, is a, is a, is a tragedy. It's a tragedy. And, um, yeah, so if anybody out there feels drawn to the conversation, you know, just know you're welcome. Hmm. Rachel? I think Raven covered it. Yeah, anybody listening? feel free to contact us. We'd love to communicate with you. Um, I guess the last thing I would add, short and simple, don't dumb yourself down to fit in with other people. Don't compromise yourself or your message so you can be a part of a clique. The right people will find you. Just keep doing your thing. Stay true to yourself. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for coming to Parallax and, and thanks for preaching the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel! That's right. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for having, having us. It was really nice to meet you guys like this. Great yeah, it was, challenging it was, it was questions. wonderful for me, yeah. Uh, Rachel, Raven, thank you very much for coming. That was amazing. Thank you. Yeah. I uh, hope you stay in contact. Of course. Yeah. Wish you all the best. Keep in touch with Parallax. And we have some events coming up uh, uh, in the next couple mm -hmm. days. Um, we'll be talking with a guy who wrote a book called um, The Meaning of Being a Man, which is sort of the polar opposite of, well, the philosopher queens in, in a sense. But And then we also have some, uh, we also have Bard, Alexander Bard talking with Greg Henriquez on Tuesday. Um, nice. Another trialogue. So, oh, so, uh, great. Great. so that's what we're up to here. Wonderful. Okay.